Warning, this video will contain spoilers up to chapter 1043. You've been warned. Hello, Manakamo Taiji. This is Joy Girl, and we're going to talk about the ever intriguing, mysterious, and peculiar existence of the CP0. But if you really want to hear something quite peculiar, that's the fact that not all of you guys currently watching this video is subscribed to this channel. So let's change that, shall we? And make sure to click that red subscribe button so that you don't miss out on frequent One Piece discussions. All right, onto the video, shall we? So the Cypherpole Age Zero have remained a pretty mysterious entity ever since Dressrosa. But I have to say that I actually largely viewed them as characters to just help move the story along, you know, seed mysteries or even be a useful part of narrating the story rather than really thinking about them as fully fleshed out characters in their own right. And I don't mean that to say they didn't intrigue me because they certainly did, especially when it came to Rob Lucci and Kaku. The fact that these formerly disgraced CP9 members actually made a comeback, rose in their ranks to actually make it into the CP0, that really excited me, even if only for the chance to see the improved and stronger straw hats have a round two against what I imagine is a similarly improved and stronger cypher pole agents. And even in the case of these agents that we see at Wano, and even from when we saw some of them at Dressrosa, I was always curious about them from a story development standpoint, but my interest was always in the sense of how are they going to move the story forward, what sort of developments are we going to see as a result of their actions and interactions. And when we got to Wano especially, I was always thinking along the lines of what role are they going to play in the raid and what does this mean in terms of the possibility of the world government and the marines becoming involved at Wano. It was always in line with these sort of questions rather than thinking about the characters individually, you know, what drives these characters, what are their motives, what sort of character development are we going to see, what are their individual arcs going to be. And to some extent this can only be natural because of the assumptions you're going to make given what we know of them as being CP0 members, meaning that they work directly under, directly for the world government and the Celestial Dragons. And up until very recently, we really didn't have much to suggest that they did have feelings and emotions and ambitions of their own, or more accurately, morals and values of their own. You know, they very much acted like the simply unfeeling and blindly loyal bodyguards or henchmen of the Celestial Dragons. And even when the existence of S.W.O.R.D. became revealed to us during the intermissions between the Axe and Wano, that did raise my interest in CP0, especially because of the dialogue between Drake and Kobe. You could sense that there was some sort of rivalry or animosity between the two groups. But again, because of what we know of Cypher Pole's role within the world government, and then what we could also make out from the confirmed members of S.W.O.R.D., such as Kobe and his ideals of trying to reform the Marines so that they do their job in protecting citizens, I think it was pretty easy to assume that these two organizations were counterposed in terms of their allegiance and in terms of their values. Again, it really didn't spark any questions or intrigue as to whether these individual members of the CP0 truly follow suit in terms of the ideology and the values and the justice of the world government or the Celestial Dragons. But of course, this has drastically changed in the more recent chapters, particularly chapters 1042 to 1043. Maybe you could even say from chapter 1041, Oda does show a much more human side of the CP0 members. When the bowler hat leader guy sees Maha defeated after their fight against Izzo, he looks visibly upset and you know he's cursing and he's expressive. Like he genuinely cares. But that alone isn't really enough to raise speculations about his morals and about his values in my opinion. Because seeing cypher pole agents care about each other isn't really something new. I mean we saw this back when we got the cover story following the CP9 agents, you know covering what they were up to after they got fired and disgraced for failing at Enya's lobby. You saw the team really care for Luchi when he was injured and whilst he was still in recovery. They actually went to some great lengths to raise money to ensure that he could be hospitalized and receive care. The CP9's independent report is actually one of my favorite cover stories for this reason because it really showed us a different side to the agents than we were used to at Enya's lobby. But still then, that doesn't necessarily change them as characters in terms of where their morality lies because we see that both Luchi and Kaku have returned
turned to becoming agents and have actually rose in ranks to become members of the CP0. And at the Reverie, these two don't show any hesitation when they come to save St. Charles and follow his orders in trying to capture and enslave Shirohoshi. Luchi even makes a bit of a speech about the royalty of the Celestial Dragons which just knows no bounds. And when St. Charles ordered him to kill Neptune, Luchi was ready to do it. And as Luchi, you could tell he was deriving some sort of sick, perverse pleasure from getting to do so. And we do actually already know of Luchi's past, his, his morals and his dark backstory. You know, he's not a character with some tragic past that makes his current villainy redeemable. I've always found that a part of his allure is exactly because of how dark and how evil he is through and through. And we do already know that he follows his own line of dark justice and that he is actually quite deeply loyal to the Celestial Dragons. And look, we haven't quite seen the same level of commitment or even sadistic tendencies in the other members like Haku, for example. But the point is that simply caring for your colleagues or your comrades isn't quite enough to suggest that they do have morals which conflict with their roles as direct agents for the world government and for the Celestial Dragons. Because everything else that we had seen suggested that these members currently here at Wano were quite similar in their blind obedience in following world government orders. For example, when we see the first confrontation between Drake and the CP0 at Onigashima, and Drake demands an answer for their being here, for their backroom dealings, the bowler hat guy responds that inconvenient truths have to be erased before preparing to attack Drake. And this really does cement their role in terms of their espionage and their shady dealings, you know, in their role as, as a poo called it, as the lapdogs of the Celestial Dragons. So really, the moment that changed things and really made things interesting was of course in chapter 1042 when Drake tells the bowler hat guy that he is fulfilling and following his own line of justice, that he's carrying out his own brand of justice and the CP0 member responds that he's envious of him. And that really gets you thinking what does he mean by that? Because whatever speculations you want to make about his morals or his own line of justice, the one thing that becomes quite clear is that as a cypher pole agent, he really lacks agency, which is actually an oxymoron when you think about it that an agent lacks agency but anyways it seems like he's saying that he doesn't have the luxury to do what he wants to do what his values and his morals tell him to do and then Oda being the masterful mangaka that he is actually shows this to us directly right afterwards because at the end of that chapter we see the CP0 member fulfill his role in going to kill Luffy or so he thought anyways and we know that this isn't something that he necessarily wanted to do because of his dismay and his response when he he found out that this was his task. But then in chapter 1043, we see him go out quite like a Chad, you know, completely accepting his fate, now having fulfilled his mission. And then also to add to the interest, we see the frilly neck CP0 member tip his hat in respect of his fallen comrade. And again, this relationship, this interaction between the two agents affirms what we've already seen of the Cypherpole agents, that regardless of their values in terms of justice, that they do share some sort of bond as a team. But really, these last couple of chapters makes you start thinking more about the Cypherpole as individuals individual members, as individual agents, as well as in terms of an organization. Like I said, it was pretty clear that that bowler hat guy wasn't too happy about his task being having to interfere with Kaido's fight against Luffy. Now, whether that's because he knew it was a suicide mission or whether it was because it conflicted with his own personal values, that's not too clear. And maybe it really isn't as deep as we're speculating it to be. You know, maybe it doesn't have to do with grand ideas of values and justice. Maybe it really was quite as simple as the fact that he didn't want to embark on a mission that he knew would get him killed and he envied Drake's ability to do what he wants because he knew that he can't even if it means his death. But is there something further to it and is there a reason why he can't do what he wants? Is there more to it than just being simply a member of the CP0? Are they under some sort of oath or some sort of power? You know, is there some sort of history, some sort of backstory there? And also, there being more to what the CP0 member said actually makes sense as to why only now Oda would show us further characterization and develop the CP0 members more after all of these chapters if there is actually more to this character. You know, because there is actually more to this CP0 member than being a simple lapdog. And besides, we already know that Oda has a backstory for essentially all of these characters, even those who are just secondary characters. So chances are is that this agent is also a lot more fleshed out than he originally seemed. And although he should be dead because 
Kaido gave him quite the beating. There is still a chance that he may be still alive because after all, this is One Piece. And in that case, it would be really cool if Oda actually does develop him further to showcase the tensions within the CP0 or between the Cypherpol agents and the world government. Or, you know, this could even lead to further developments between the CP0 and Sword, for example, or between different factions within the world government. Or this could even lead into Elbaf if we follow an idea that's been around for a while, that the CP0 agents, or at least some of the CP0 agents, were originally the orphans that Mother Carmel sold to the world government, as we saw during Big Mom's flashback during the Whole Cake Island arc. And I personally don't think that there's any question that at least some agents who are in the Cypherpol organization were originally orphans that were traded by Mother Carmel to the world government. Oda actually makes that pretty clear in the series. When Mother Carmel is negotiating the price for Lin Lin, she mentions that as a Cypherpol agent, Lin Lin would make a great shield for the Celestial Dragons and also makes a comment that orphans make great spies. So from those pieces of dialogue, it's pretty clear that some orphans do make their way into becoming Cypherpol agents after being sold to the world government. Now as to whether the Cypherpol agents that we have here at Wano, whether they were originally orphans, that remains speculative. But in saying that, there are some good pieces of potential evidence or hints to suggest that they are. You've got Maha who has the mask with the circle eyes and then the similarly circle protruding mouth. And it actually just so happens that during Big Mom's flashback, you do see a kid, you do see an orphan who has those same circle eyes and also a protruding mouth. You could also make some connections between some of the other CP0 members through their long limbs. For example, we know for sure that one of the orphans at the orphanage was actually a member of the Long Arm tribe. And maybe you could speculate that that frilled Cypherpol agent is maybe also from the same Long Arm tribe given what we can see of his arms, because it does seem like he has quite elongated arms. And so that's an idea that has been circulating that these CP0 members were actually kids from the orphanage. And I do like that idea a lot. You could say that these resemblances are actually quite striking and could be potentially great hints. But in saying that, I do also have to ask some questions. Like for one, Maha with his very circularly featured face, we know for sure that that's a mask that he actually holds using a stick. And it is possible that that orphan with the similar facial features was also wearing a mask as well, but he was never carrying his mask. It was almost like it was a permanent feature of his face. And I'm not saying that that necessarily invalidates the idea because the style of mask could have always changed. And then as for the possible possibly long arm tribe CP0 member. Obviously that hasn't been confirmed that he is actually a member of that tribe because it could just very well be that it's his coat that just makes his arms look so long. But the greater question and probably the more damning question is supposing that these CP0 members were in fact the kids from the orphanage, how did they survive? Because during Big Mom's flashback, we actually see that both these kids, the one with the circular features as well as with the long arms, were actually there and present during Big Mom's birthday meal during that feast. So as far as we know, Lin Lin should have eaten them too. And I suppose things like that could be easily explained, you know, saying that they managed to run away, for example, which then also raises the question as to how then did they make their way into the world government and becoming a cypher poll agent. And yes, yeah, speculating on all of that is very well possible, but we would really be relying on speculations that would be based on not a whole lot of details or information that's actually confirmed for us. But I don't know, maybe some of you have some ideas and speculations as to how this could have actually happened. And you know, if you do, then make sure to leave them below because I'd love to have a read of it. But in any case, those pesky questions aside, I would actually really like it if those speculations, if that idea that the CP0 members were actually the orphans from Big Mom's childhood, I would really like it if that turned out to be true. Because the expectation that we are going to go to Elbaf next is so high on essentially everyone's mind. And you guys will know that I've talked about that too and why I really like the idea of God going to the land of giants and how that could really make sense for the story and how that could really make sense for Luffy's development. So it really would be cool if the CP0 members have a backstory that ties in further with the story and then also get some further character development along the way. You know, my interest in that CP0 member, the bowler hat guy, has really risen astronomically because of the recent chapters. And I really wouldn't mind if these individual agents and the organization was developed further because I think it could really bring some great conflict, some great 
great tensions to the surface within the world government and between world government organizations. And it does actually seem like Oda may have some further to story to share in that regard. But anyways, this is a topic that I have also been thinking about as a result of the latest chapters, which I think may not be receiving as much attention because of all the other big reveals that happened as of late. But let me know whether you guys have been thinking about this as well or whether you have any thoughts based on what I've just discussed. Make sure to leave a comment below. Don't forget to like and share the video. Please do subscribe for more One Piece discussions. You can also join our Joy Fleet Discord server or even become a patron member. And I want to thank all my patrons for help supporting the channel. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.